When I was really young, seven or eight maybe, I can't remember which, I stumbled across a photograph of what I was sure had to be the most amazing thing ever assembled. In this old black and white snapshot were two fearsome dinosaurs, posed with their jaws stretched wide, their long tails wriggling, and their feet firmly planted in the ground. And remember, these weren't just any dinosaurs. These were skeletons of the greatest dinosaur of all, Tyrannosaurus rex. A pair of them, depicted moments before battling each other over the carcass of the dismembered hadrosaur at their feet. And I decided right then and there that wherever those skeletons are, whatever museum in which they stand, that I will visit them one day to see the battling tyrants firsthand. So I'm sure you can imagine my disappointment when I learned that that little dream of mine would never come true because the dinosaurs in that grainy photograph were never really there. It all began with Henry Fairfield Osborne, an experienced fossil hunter and animal expert working at the American Museum of Natural History. Osborne, young and cocky, had big plans for the museum. His goal was to build the greatest fossil collection on Earth, and to follow through with this plan, he would need the help from some of the greatest explorers and scientists America had to offer. Most notable of all, a young and gifted fossil collector from Kansas named Barnum Brown. After working for a few years in the Badlands of Wyoming to find skeletons to fill the museum's Hall of Fossil Mammals, Brown set his sights on outcrops in the Badlands of Montana, because Osborne wanted dinosaurs. And in 1902, that's just what Brown found. He and his team began excavating a series of very large fossils from an unknown creature, embedded firmly into a cliffside. Brown then had the bones packaged and shipped back to New York. This wasn't a complete skeleton, mind you. In fact, it was rather scrappy, comprising just a few vertebrae, a lower leg bone, parts of a pelvis, and most notably, portions of the animal's fearsome skull, including a set of huge jaws. The biggest killer dinosaur known at the time was the mighty Jurassic hunter Allosaurus, named some 30 years before. Packaged in a body 8 meters long with a set of large claws wielded by powerful arms and a skull filled with dozens of sharp, recurved teeth, Allosaurus was the terror of the Jurassic. This new skeleton was from the much later Cretaceous period, and it looked very different. Firstly, it was nearly twice the size of Allosaurus, standing 6 meters high and stretching to nearly 12 meters long. And as an upper arm bone preserved with the skeleton would show, its arms were tiny, so small that at first, Osborne found it hard to believe that it belonged with the rest of the skeleton. He thought the bone must have come from a smaller dinosaur that got jumbled up with the larger carnivore. By 1905, Osborne was ready to announce the new species, and so he concocted what would become the most recognizable title ever given to an extinct creature the Tyrant Lizard King, Tyrannosaurus Rex. But Osborne wasn't happy with just one T-Rex, so he sent Brown back to Montana to search for a new skeleton to fill in the gaps in his knowledge. At first, Brown had little luck, but he pressed on. His determination seemed to be paying off when he came across a lower jaw, similar to the one from the first specimen, as well as the back portion of another T-Rex skull. But sadly, the rest of the head and body were nowhere to be found. So Brown returned to a string of 15 interconnected vertebrae he'd passed up a few days before. With hopes that it just might be what he was searching for, he was excited to find that the skeleton ran deeper into the sediment, suggesting that there may very well be an entire skeleton preserved. His suspicions were confirmed when he made the discovery of a lifetime. Lying beside the skeleton in a single, massive chert block was a four-foot skull with a complete set of lower jaws studded with dozens of blunt six-inch teeth. Brown wrote to Osborne to inform him of his success. He had found a second T-Rex, one with a skull. Excited by Brown's letters, Osborne wanted to examine the fossil for himself. So he traveled to Montana to see the specimen up close. Excavation proved to be a real challenge. The blocks containing the skull and jaws alone weighed upwards of 4,000 pounds. 
and they had to devise a plan to transport the enormous blocks of rock and bone out of the quarry and across 45 miles of rugged land where they would be loaded onto a train headed straight for New York. Luckily, their dinosaur arrived safely at the museum 12 days later. As the skeleton was being cleaned and prepared, wonders beyond description emerged from the rock. They realized that their new T-Rex was everything they dreamed it to be, and more. Aside from missing just its legs and its puny arms, their new Tyrannosaurus was essentially complete, and the skull was even more perfect and frightening than anybody could have hoped. Now that they had more fossils to work with, it was time to put the king of the dinosaurs on display. Osborne wanted to see Brown's discoveries displayed in the best way imaginable, and he wanted it done right, so he commissioned the museum's very own E.S. Chrisman, a skilled artist and sculptor, and an expert at reconstructing past life. Chrisman meticulously sculpted every single bone in the Tyrannosaurus skeleton to a smaller scale, ending up with two miniature replicas of the tyrant, complete with flexible joints, so they could experiment with which posture they would mount the full-sized animals in. Everybody wanted to have some say in how the skeletons would be positioned, but it was a reptile expert from the Bronx Zoo whose idea was finally chosen. A collaborative effort between Osborne, Brown, and Chrisman allowed the king of the dinosaurs to finally stand tall once again, for the first time in millions of years, in all of its one-sixth scale glory. Osborne set the scene as follows. It's early morning along the shore of a Cretaceous lake four million years ago. A herbivorous dinosaur, Trachodon, venturing from the water for a breakfast of succulent vegetation has been caught and partly devoured by a giant, flesh-eating Tyrannosaurus. As this monster crouches over the carcass, busy dismembering it, another Tyrannosaurus is attracted to the scene. Approaching, it rises nearly to its full height to grapple the more fortunate hunter and dispute the prey. The crouching figure reluctantly stops eating and accepts the challenge, partly rising to spring on its adversary. At the time when Osborne wrote those words, in 1913, nobody really knew how old dinosaurs were. They had no means of figuring that out. We now know that a scene such as this one would only have been possible some 66 million years ago. Osborne thought that this was the perfect way to display his new dinosaurs. As he writes, the psychological moment of tense inertia before the combat was chosen to be the best show of positions of the limbs and bodies, as well as to picture an incident in the life history of these giant reptiles. Osborne desperately wanted to show off the beautiful skull of the second specimen by placing it in a crouched position, bringing its gnarly smile of some 60 teeth close to eye level of guests. Other dinosaurs were more than willing to donate bones to the Tyrannosaurs to fill in missing parts. Osborne was ready to create the most amazing prehistoric scene ever assembled. Mounting the skeletons in such a grand and elegant way turned out to be easier said than done. The sheer size of the skeletons alone were a huge hurdle. Osborne notes, the height of the head in the standing position reaches from 18 to 20 feet above the ground. The knee joint alone reaches six feet above the ground. All the bones are massive. The pelvis, femur, and skull are extremely heavy. On top of the extreme weight of the fossils, there simply wasn't enough room to display specimens of such extreme size in the exhibit hall. So Osborne had to settle on mounting just a single Tyrannosaur. In 1915, he chose to exhibit the better of the two Rexes, the second specimen of course, which would come to be known as AMNH 5027. It was mounted in a rather drab, Godzilla-like posture, upright, tail dragging. No rival killer ready to grapple over its prey. No dismembered trachodon at its feet, taken down while feasting on a breakfast of succulent vegetation. No trace of an early morning along the shore of a Cretaceous lake. But that didn't really matter. T-Rex didn't need to be pictured in the tense moments before combat with the broken remains of its unfortunate prey below to be frightening. The bones themselves got the message across just fine, as I'm sure countless frightened museum visitors would testify. 
Once the dinosaur was finally unveiled, the public went wild. Visitors flocked to the museum in droves. The New York Times labeled the new species the king of all kings in the domain of life, the prize fighter of antiquity, the absolute warlord of the earth, as well as other ridiculous names. And over the years, as Barnum Brown continued to search far and wide for new fossils to add to the museum's collection, the tyrant lizard stood tall in an increasingly crowded dinosaur hall, sandwiched between a squatting triceratops and a hulking brontosaurus. The fearsome dinosaur remained a popular attraction right up until Osborne's death in 1935. For over 25 years, New York was the only place in the world you could go to see a T-Rex. Until the outbreak of World War II, when tensions in New York were high, as fear that a barrage of German airships could level the city at any turn loomed in the air. So, in 1941, Brown prepared for an attack that would never come, and he did the unthinkable. He sold his original 1902 specimen to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for just $7,000 the equivalent of 96000 in today's value, with hopes that if New York, and by extension the American Museum of Natural History, would be reduced to rubble at the hands of the Germans, along with his world-class killer dinosaur, that at least the original T-Rex, the one that inspired Osborne to invent such a striking name for the animal, would survive. The Carnegie Museum mounted their prized Tyrannosaur soon after, with spare parts sculpted after the New York specimen. And, like the New York specimen, it suffered through the same upright posture. Barnum Brown would spend the next several decades in the American West and in Alberta, Canada, in search of dinosaurs. Visitors to the American Museum reaped the benefits of his labor. Brown hadn't just helped Osborne build an extensive fossil collection, one to rival those of the Carnegie and Peabody Museums. He had laid the foundations for what still is, the richest collection of dinosaur fossils on Earth. Barnum Brown's work at the American Museum of Natural History lasted until his death in 1963, just a few days before his 90th birthday. Over the span of his career, he collected a total of five Tyrannosaurus rex specimens. As a paleontologist, his gifts to the world can and are still being enjoyed at the American Museum, as many of the specimens in the Great Dinosaur Hall were collected by him while working in the remote Badlands. The first T-Rex ever pieced together, back in 1915, was reassembled in the 1990s to reflect a more natural and scientifically accurate interpretation of the animal's posture. With its long, stiff tail raised high above the ground, extending back some 35 feet behind a cast replica of its skull. Beside it is the original skull, displayed behind glass at eye level of the viewers. And while the reputation of Henry Fairfield Osborne has since become tarnished by his vigorously racist beliefs, Barnum Brown is remembered positively. And though I'll never get to see the dueling tyrannosaurs at the American Museum of Natural History, there is a place where I can see the next best thing. The first T-Rex, the one sold by Brown in 1941, remained in its original pose at the Carnegie Museum until 2005, when plans for a renovation of the dinosaur halls went underway. A more modern reconstruction of this famous specimen was presented, pieced together with knowledge gained from some of the 50 other partial T-Rex skeletons found since this one was first pulled from the ground in Montana over a century before. But this time, it wouldn't stand alone. It was placed next to two other dinosaurs. One, the carcass of a hadrosaur, and the other, a second Tyrannosaurus. And so, as the scene goes, a flesh-eating Tyrannosaurus had caught and killed its prey. A Trachodon, let's say, for continuity's sake. And as the story went, as the monster crouched over the carcass, busy dismembering it, another Tyrannosaurus was attracted to the scene, where it prepared to grapple with the more fortunate hunter over the kill. The crouching figure reluctantly stopped eating and accepted the challenge, and it began to rise up to spring on its adversary. Their feet 
planted among succulent vegetation, basking under rays of light beating down from the sun in the early morning along the shore of a Cretaceous lake. <laughs>